Most of us have heard a lot about antioxidants like vitamins A, C, and E. Um, <clears throat> and when we do, we often think of mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, which uses oxygen to oxidize um, uh, steps within our metabolism and create energy. What we don't think about is maybe some of the other areas where oxygenation can occur. For example, what about uh, hemoglobin in red blood cells? Well, you'd say, well, a red blood cell is a controlled environment. That, uh, yes, it could, obviously could be very uh, oxygenating to be inside a red blood cell, but it's, again, uh, enclosed in that red, red cell membrane. Red cells only last an average of about 90 days, and then they die. What happens when they die? That membrane splits apart, and that uh, oxidized hemoglobin spews out into the bloodstream. Oxidized hemoglobin can damage, can and does damage the intima, the endothelial lining of the artery, as well as tissues associated with it. So that's a problem. And it's an oxida oxidation problem, and it's uh, a problem that uh, we haven't discussed before, or many people haven't discussed, many people are not thinking about. Uh, what does the body do for that kind of problem? They usually make a protein, and that's the case here. The protein that the body makes to clean up hemoglobin is called haptoglobin. Now, <clears throat> And when you start to get into genetics, you start to find variations. And sometimes the variations don't work as well as the normal or wild-type gene. And yes, that's exactly what happens with haptoglobin 2. Haptoglobin 1, here in this uh, illustration, is the normal or wild-type uh, gene. It binds to hemoglobin and allows the uh, hemoglobin to be cleaned up rather than continue to cause oxidation damage. Now, <clears throat> haptoglobin 2 uh, is illustrated here. This is haptoglobin 2-1, a heterozygote. In other words, they got a 2 from mom and a 1 from dad or vice versa. And this is a haptoglobin 2-2. Two, two. They got a 2 from mom and a 2 from dad. These, uh, these people have significant uh, increased risk. In fact, let's go back and uh, look at that. Take a look at a slide that uh, I got back when I was working with uh, Amy and Brad. Um, <clears throat> uh, Amy Donine, Brad Bale. And um, talking about haptoglobin 2-2. So haptoglobin 2-2 diabetics are five times more likely to have cardiovascular disease than haptoglobin 1-1 diabetics. Haptoglobin 2-2 two -two diabetics are three times more likely to have uh, cardiovascular disease than haptoglobin 2-1 diabetics. And so in other words, you've got a, a dose rec response curve here. The more HAP2 that you have, the more damage you get. Now, <clears throat> we can go into some, and in fact, I will talk a little bit about how the molecule is actually arranged in HAP2 versus HAP1. Um, and you can see how it, the HAP2 creates uh, more difficulties pulling that, ha that hemoglobin out. But before we do, let's just look at a, another critical point. And that is the uh, haptoglobin A1C uh, greater than 6.5 is a major risk factor for this. So one way to, to control the risk associated with haptoglobin 2 is to keep your hemoglobin A1C less than 6.5. Now, why is that? I don't think we know entirely yet, but it's a good, uh, one good hunch is that, you know what? Uh, hemoglobin A1C is the most well-known um, glycation end product or advanced glycation end product, AGE, and the AGEs are what cause damage. So <clears throat> maybe this um, glycosylated hemoglobin, or hemoglobin A1C, is actually uh, somewhat damaged by that covalent bond. Whether it is or not, again, the research is really clear. Keeping your hemoglobin A1C is 
below 6.5 is a huge improvement in risk for diabetics with HAP2-2. Back to the risk associated with HAP2-1 and HAP2-2, there's a good case to be made that the vast majority of cardiovascular disease uh, happening with diabetics is happening among uh, diabetics with HAP2-1 and HAP2-2 because this is a very common gene. If you have it, you should know. One other thing before we move beyond this illustration, and I'll provide the, uh, the link to this illustration in this article. It was in uh, Journal of the American College of Cardiology uh, back in 2015. One more uh, scary thing to think about is that uh, haptoglobin 2 also seems to have an impact on uh, HDL, good cholesterol function. Uh, H, you, you get effective function over here with HAP1 and defective function in HAP22 uh, two, two with actually it appears to uh, contribute to HDL um, increasing oxidation of things like uh, LDL, oxidized LDL uh, in individuals with that uh, genotype. So again, a lot of uh, interesting and scary things to, to look at. Um, <clears throat> why did this come up? Well, here's why. I was looking through uh, some um, articles regarding haptoglobin and found a recent one, uh, September of 2018, with an update in uh, February of 2019. Basically what they were showing, and this is in the Journal of Immunology, uh, in mammals, haptoglobin is acute phase plasma protein. Uh, forget about the acute phase. Basically, that just means it's a plasma protein that uh, tends to, to work on and help decrease. It causes inflammation in order to try to uh, decrease oxidation in this case. It's got a high affinity for hemoglobin released by intravascular hemolysis. Intra meaning inside, vascular meaning uh, inside the vessel. Hemolysis meaning breakdown of the red cells. The resultant hemoglobin haptoglobin complexes are bound and cleared by the scavenger receptor, uh, CD163, which you saw on the previous uh, illustration. But here's what was interesting, and again, it's just more of a geeky interest item than anything else. What they were doing was looking at haptoglobin expression in cartilaginous fishes, uh, in which the binding is not so important anymore. What they found was... Um, they continued to have very strong uh, expression of haptoglobin, even though this uh, process was not needed anymore. Basically what that meant from an immunological perspective is that there's some other function going on with haptoglobin. Well, you know what? That's not really that much of a surprise because <clears throat> we've known about other functions of haptoglobin for a while. Uh, you ever hear of a uh, hero? Let, uh, let, me, let me jump over something real quick. We have actual, or we, it, the uh, haptoglobin uh, sequence has been developed, and that's a picture of it. Now, a minute, a minute ago, I was saying we have known that there are other functions of haptoglobin. Ever hear of leaky gut? Um, <clears throat> I'm, okay, here you go. There's a fellow named Alessio Fizzano. He, sent, he first discovered this problem back when he was working in a small office in the back of the library at University of Maryland. Uh, now he, com he runs a huge uh, or heptoglobin or uh, zonulin research unit at Harvard. Uh, gluten, you see that up here. This is actually a diagram of the uh, tight junctions and the lining of the gut. What uh, Alessio Fasano found and has been uh, verified since then is this. The precursor molecule for haptoglobin 2,2 is a molecule called zonulin that you see right here. Zonulin impacts some receptors in um, liner, uh, 
lining uh, uh, tissue, such as gut lining, uh, thyroid gland lining, <clears throat> other liners. Uh, those liners are characterized by having a single uh, level of single cell level of tissue membrane, single cell membrane, which is held together by a tight junction. This is called a tight junction right here. Or that's the representation of the tight junction. So let's go back. Zonulin has actually been discovered to create a protein which releases tight junctions. So Fasano, after finding that, said, you know what? I wonder if this has to do... He saw correlation between zonulin, HAP22, and um, leaky gut. And he said, I wonder if zonulin has anything to do with the tight, dun tight junctions in these membranes. Sure enough, uh, that has been um, confirmed. And actually, there's a significant amount of association epidemiologically or in the research between people that have HAP22 and things like leaky gut, uh, inflammatory disease of the bowel, um, Hashimoto's disease, other inflammatory processes. So there's a whole um, Pandora's box of issues associated with this thing. Um, I'm not obviously going to have, obviously not going to have time to go deeper into that in this video. But if you've made it this far, we've gone very fast. We've jumped around, bumped around. And uh, for those of you that are still hanging in there, thank you so much for your interest.